Hi, everyone. Welcome back uh, to our closing session and our closing keynote uh, presentation on the last day of the RSV 2021. Uh, please make sure you stick around after the keynote. Our ladies from the federal office will close out our session in the day. Um, additionally, if you have any questions for Joe, feel free to put that in the chat box on the right side of your screen or the Q&A box. Um, Andy will be monitoring that during uh, this session. So as always, this session is recorded. Uh, you can play it back at will. We hope that we are not uh, going to see Matt sing and dance this time around uh, like I did earlier today and that everything will go smoothly. Again, if you have any tech problems, uh, you can return to the attendee hub and on the right side of your screen, you'll see instructions on how to uh, contact support there. And uh, without any further ado, let's jump into um, introducing Joe. Uh, Joe is an amazing partner of ours, and we asked him to speak, and he came in and said, man, I'd love to. And so Joe, uh, Joe Tai is the head coach of Values Coach, Inc. He works with hospitals and other healthcare organizations to help them build a more positive culture of ownership by engaging staff at every level in a commitment to shared values and expectations. Joe earned a master's degree in hospital administration from the University of Iowa and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where he was class co-president. He is the author or co-author of 12, count them, 12 books, including the Lord's Prescription and Building a Culture of Ownership in Healthcare, which was named AGN Book of the Year. He created the 12 Core Action Values, a course on values-based life and leadership skills, that has been called Graduate School for the Seven Habits. Prior to founding Values Coach in 1994, Joe was Chief Operating Officer for a large community teaching hospital. On the volunteer front, he was uh, founding president of the Association of Air Medical Services and a leading activist fighting against unethical tobacco industry marketing practices. Joe and his wife, Sally, have two adult children. They live on a small farmstead in Iowa and their second home is a tent in the Grand Canyon, and I am incredibly jealous of that. Again, at the end of this presentation, we will have Q&A session, so feel free to write your questions in the comment box on the way. And Joe, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you very much, and I apologize for the delay. You know, two years ago, I thought Zoom was something that sports cars did, and now I'm finding that I'm Zooming myself every day and still figuring out as we go along. It is a pleasure to be here because what you are doing now today for rural health care has never been more important. And I'm afraid it's going to be even more important in the years to come. Somebody sent me this picture. And I am absolutely haunted by this picture because what emotions are being reflected in that caregiver's face? You know, it could be anxiety. She could be looking in the supply closet and saying, you mean I have to wear the same mask again tomorrow? She could be looking at a schedule and saying, I can't do it. I can't do another 14 hour shift. She could also with that expression be praying for a patient, couldn't she? Or, or feeling pride in a new nurse that she's precepting who finally got something right. And that is such a great metaphor for the emotional maelstrom that COVID and the recession and everything else that's going on has put us through. I'm also haunted by this picture. This is Europe in August of 1914 and the young men are going to war. World War I, their, their leaders have told them this will be a short war. We're gonna win fast and you'll be home by Christmas. The bands are playing, the girls are throwing flowers and all the volunteers are marching off. And this is four years later, November 1918, those men coming back home, those who survived. There were no bands playing, no girls throwing flowers. The leaders were hiding in the shadows. And, and I fear that that could be what we're looking at today. Remember the first three or four months of COVID and, and out in front of hospitals and, and long-term care facilities, there were people holding signs saying our heroes and they were sending donuts and pizza and, and celebrating driving by in their cars and honking. And we were seeing cartoons like this, you know, come home safe, mom, our frontline heroes. And now Rose Sherman, a couple months ago, almost a year ago now, wrote an article in Nurse Leader when nurses are not okay. And so many caregivers today have been beaten down by what they're going through and they're not fine 
they're this kind of fine, frustrated, insecure, negative, and exhausted. And you look at this picture and those two nurses so desperately need a hug. And you look at the bed behind them in that intensive care unit and you can be very sure that bed is not empty because the patient got up and walked out. Uh, and the trauma that people are going through is going to continue for a long time. And the work that you're doing is going to be so much more important. And we keep hearing about this light at the end of the tunnel as if suddenly COVID's going to go away and everything's going to be lollipops and rainbows and happy days are here again. Well, that light at the end of the tunnel is not like a finish line. Like we run through the finish line and it's over. It's more like a, a torch, a flickering torch. And it is our obligation when we get there ourselves to pick up that torch and carry it, to illuminate the way for the people who are coming along behind us and to illuminate the way into the the next tunnel because we know there will be a next tunnel. And the people behind us, they're gonna be carrying so much personal grief. We've lost almost 600,000 Americans to COVID. Emotional trauma. A friend of mine, Diana Handel, wrote a book about post-COVID PTSD. She said, COVID was the earthquake. Widespread PTSD among caregivers is gonna be the aftershocks. People are struggling with financial distress, career dislocation. There's been anger and tr distrust. And we as caregivers have an obligation to ex expand our definition of care, who we care for from the people in the bed or in the treatment room in front of us to our entire communities. And unfortunately, especially recently, we're going the wrong way. This is, this is a headline from just a few days ago. COVID deaths are rising again in almost every state. And it's a pandemic of the, the unvaccinated. And this is a quote from today. The chief medical officer at University of Kansas Medical Center says, we're, we're at a tipping point. And if we don't take this seriously, we could easily be, remember last November? We could easily be back there. And many of the hospitals we work with, what we're hearing is that they're full, their intensive care units are full and their people are exhausted and they can't, they're, they're struggling with staffing. That's one reason I did this uh, project and I'm gonna send you afterward, everybody's gonna get a link to staystrongforus.com. It's a free ebook and it has messages from more than a hundred healthcare leaders, uh, motivational speakers and authors, authorities on human wellness. And it's a beautiful ebook and I, I encourage you to go read it, download it, share it with people, because we are not out of the woods yet. And the light at the end of the tunnel is starting to flicker and, and flicker badly. And this is one of the messages in that book. Tony Slonim is president and CEO of Renown Health in Nevada. It's a, a very big healthcare system. And what he said is as caregivers, remember you have an obligation he didn't just say it's a nice thing for you to take care of yourself. You have an obligation to take care of yourself and your family and not use up all those resources at work. We have to encourage people to take care of themselves. And that's a big part of what a culture of ownership is. And I want to share with you what I consider to be the ultimate paradox in life. And it's this, whatever you most need at any time in your life will be hardest for you to find at precisely the time you need it most. It's easy to be motivated when everything's going great, isn't it? It's when the roof is falling in on you that it's hardest to be motivated, but that's when it's most important. It's easy to have integrity when you have no temptation. It's easy to have courage when your fears are small, to persevere over little speed bumps. It's when the fears become nightmares and the speed bumps become brick walls that you most need courage and perseverance. And if you haven't started working on it ahead of time, that's when it's gonna be hardest to find. It's easy to commit yourself to serving others when you have everything you need yourself. It's hardest when you don't have everything you need, but that's when it's most important, not only for the people you serve, but for, for your own good, your own self esteem and self image. And that paradox that what you need is hardest when you need it the most applies to having a positive culture in your organization. Retired Admiral Eric Olson wrote an article in the McKinsey Quarterly on the war on the coronavirus. 
And he said, culture must not be sacrificed in the middle of a crisis. If you're not tending to your culture, it's going to go someplace. You don't want it to go. And once it does, it's going to be almost impossible, if not impossible, to get it back. And culture has never been more important than it is today. And because we're all so overwhelmed, I was at a hospital last week that was running at more than 100% census on the inpatient side, and they had more than 70 people waiting for beds in their emergency department, and people were exhausted. It's really hard to work on culture when you're so overwhelmed, but it has also never been more important because it is culture that nurtures and sustains our workforce through these difficult, challenging times. And at Values Coach, we have two key guiding insights, guides all of our work. Number one, because culture is shaped by the collective attitudes and behaviors of the people who work there, culture does not change unless and until people change. You know, if you have people saying, not my problem, we got to change our culture, but it's not me. I don't need to change my attitude. I don't need to change my relationships. You can bring in motivational speakers and give everyone a book and a happy face pin. And three months later, nobody remembers the happy face pin is upside down. Nothing has changed. But guiding insight number two is this. People will not change unless you give them a new approach and inspire them to use it. You know, we've all tried to change and fail, haven't we? <laughs> New Year's resolutions that show up dead on arrival. And our job as leaders, if we really want to work on culture, is to help people change their own personal lives in a positive way. I got a letter from Paul Udemar. He was the CEO of a critical access hospital in Nebraska. We'd been working for a, for a long time. He said, I got a whole new team and didn't have to change the people because they changed themselves. And I've come to see that as the gold standard of culture change. When enough people make that change, that commitment, then everything changes for the better. And I wanna share with you two hospitals. We do a culture assessment survey. And one of the questions in that survey says, our culture does not tolerate bullying, toxic negativity, or disrespectful behavior on a five point scale. These are two hospitals, they are in the same urban area. Um, they compete for the same patients, donors, uh, providers. Hospital number one, hospital number two, which one do you think has higher patient satisfaction? The one where eight out of 10 people agree or strongly agree with that statement, or the one where almost nobody does? And it's hospital number one. Which one has greater employee loyalty? Hospital number one. Which one has higher nursing turnover? Number two. Which one is healthier financially? Number one. Which one's had the most bad press? Number two. See, everything that, that we as hospital executives count, patient satisfaction, productivity, turnover, is all predicted by the kind of culture that we have or that we tolerate. And that gets me to this journey from accountability to a culture of ownership. You know, imagine this, we're out on a river, um, heading into the, the rapids and the guide on the back of the boat hollers out, hang on folks, this is it. The class five rapids I've warned you about all day long. Everybody grab a paddle, dig in and paddle for your life. And this guy says, I don't paddle. That's not my job. What do you do? You throw them out of the boat. You know, imagine another river trip. You're the captain of this beautiful galley ship and it is your job to get it across the water on time, on budget with your cargo intact. And you have a hundred people at the oars. 25 of those people really believe in the mission. They're putting their backs into the work, giving it everything they can. 60 are just going through the motions and 15 are actually rolling backwards. And unfortunately, that is a picture of the average American organization today, where 25 people are highly engaged in the work. Those are the people we call spark plugs. They show up every day with a smile on their face, ready to go to work. 60% are just going through the motions. They're not engaged. That doesn't mean they're doing a bad job, but they're only doing the job. And 15% in the average organization are the vampires who suck the life out of an organization, suck the energy and the joy out of the work. Jim Clifton, the CEO of Gallup, wrote a book called The Coming Jobs War. And he, he said disengaged employees, especially managers, are a quality defect, just like giving a patient the wrong medication. But the real tragedy is the impact on the disengaged person, his or herself. 
Edward Hallowell, one of the most thoughtful psychiatrists in America, writes that it is a leading cause of not achieving your personal goals and of emotional depression. You know, it's like this uh, CEO in training. If you start out life this way, it's only going to go downhill from there. So, you know, in the English language, we don't have enough words, do we? I love hot dogs. I love hiking in the Grand Canyon. I love my wife. Same word, but they're three very different things. And that applies to the word accountability. You know, it means able to be counted. We have to be very clear about what we mean by that word. And we think of the, the hierarchy, the continuum of, of accountability. And at the very bottom is hierarchical accountability. That's what most of us mean if we say, I'm going to hold you accountable. Uh, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. <laughs> that doesn't sound like fun, does it? And the truth is that you cannot hold people accountable for the things that really matter. How do you crack the whip to make somebody more proud, proud of their organization? How do you hold someone's feet to the fire to make them more compassionate or empathetic? Those things have to come from within. A much higher level is cultural accountability. That is us holding each other to a higher standard, us holding each other accountable. When somebody pulls a colleague aside and says, you know, we don't talk about people behind their backs in this hospital, in this clinic, um, in this department, that is far more powerful than being called in by the boss and reprimanded, isn't it? And the highest level is personal accountability. I don't talk about people behind their back because I care about my integrity and their dignity. And here's the thing, when people are willing to walk across hot coals on their own, you don't have to hold their feet to the fire. We call that attitude, proceed until apprehended. Uh, see opportunities when other people are whining and crying. Thank you very much, Bernie. Uh, be a cheerleader when other people are moaning and, and talking about how, how awful everything is. You all are gonna get an ebook of the Florence Prescription. It's a fictional story, so it's fun to read, but it also outlines the essential elements, those eight, to establish a culture of ownership and it goes through all the things that I don't, I don't have time to go through today. So please take that book, share it with anybody and go through that formula for building a culture of ownership and, and implement that proceed until apprehended mindset at work, at home. You know, if, if you see a problem, do something about it. If you need help, ask for help. Back to accountability. Accountability is doing what you're told to do because it's in your job description. Someone's given you an assignment and because there are consequences, usually negative consequences, it is externally imposed motivation. And there's a real downside to a culture where you're focused on accountability. Number one, it's always perceived as being punitive. If I say to you, I'm gonna hold you accountable, you don't take that as a compliment and you don't go home and brag to your kids. Hey, today I got held accountable. Second, it only applies after the fact. You cannot hold people accountable for things you want them to do in the future, only for things they have done or have not done in the past. And the biggest problem, it's a pretty low bar for expectations. If, you, if someone is only living up to the things that they could be punished for if they don't do it, you're not gonna get that higher level of pride and enthusiasm and compassion and commitment. Ownership is a much higher level. It's doing what needs to be done, whether or not it's in your job description because you have that inner motivation. And in a culture of ownership, everybody has the same job description. First and foremost, a caregiver, last but not least, a janitor. And in between, you tell me what needs to be done and I'll put myself to it. And never saying those awful three words, not my job. Now, if I walk into any building, my first impression is the bricks and mortar. But my lasting impression, if I'm in a hospital or a clinic or a government office, my lasting impression is gonna be how I'm treated. When we build a building, we go through an incredible design process. This is Tri-County Healthcare in Wadena, Minnesota. They are in the process of building a new hospital and they have hired architects, designers. They start with a beautiful rendering like this. But when CEO Joe Beiswinger spoke at their groundbreaking ceremony for the new building, 
He didn't just talk about the beautiful bricks and mortar. He talked about the culture of ownership that they've been working on, the invisible architecture they've been working on for more than three years. And one of the things he said is our investment in culture over the past three years has helped us to much more effectively cope with the challenges of COVID and, and all the things that have come with that. You know, when it comes to the things that really matter, the patient experience, the employee experience, your invisible architecture is more important than bricks and mortar. We call it the blueprint behind the blueprint. And in a very real sense, it's the soul of an organization, the way bricks and mortar are the body. Now, when you build a building, you build it in three stages. You put down a foundation, you build a superstructure, and you come in and finish it off with carpeting and wallpaper. We use that as a metaphor for invisible architecture, where the foundation is core values. You should have, where you work, where you live, you should have a statement of core values that defines who you are, what you stand for, and what you won't stand for. I'll give you an example of how powerful this is. Uh, I was in it pre-COVID, before COVID, remember when BC stood for something other than before COVID? I was in an airport. I went to the bookstore to get an energy bar. I had a, a bit of time. They had two kinds there, power bar and cliff bar. So I go back to the waiting area and I Google power bar core values, cliff bar core values. I get to power bar and I see this. We are power bar. And that's exactly what it was. It was all about us. We are so good. We are so great. You're going to love us. It was all about me, me, me. I went to Cliff Bar and they didn't talk about values. They talked about aspirations. And not only for the business, but aspirations for helping their people and their families, helping their communities, helping the planet. And you click on each box and it takes you to a list of things they're doing to meet those commitments and aspirations. I bought a Cliff Bar. Now, I happen to like power bars better, but I consistently buy cliff bars when I'm given a choice. It's the same thing with a hospital, with a clinic. People will not come to you because of your reputation for clinical excellence nearly as much as they'll come to you for your reputation for honoring important values. And there's no cookie cutter. We worked with two critical access hospitals in Wyoming. We, we gave them each a challenge, the Great Wyoming Values and Culture Challenge, to create a new statement of values. And they couldn't be more different, but each one was authentic to the organization. And so many organizations just come up with, you know, the, the generic boilerplate, I care, integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, excellence. They check the box, we've got values now but people don't embrace them if they're not authentic. And the other thing about values is it's not just the, the values on the wall at the organization. See, organizational values shape what your strategies are, but it's personal values that shape culture. Kuzis and Posner, the guys who did the leadership challenge, their research shows the more clear people are about their personal values, the more they're going to commit to the values of their organizations. And because most people have not, thought about what their values are, don't have a statement of personal values, we tell them. And we've created a whole course called These Are Your Values. It's 12 values, each has four cornerstones, 60 module course. We train people within the hospital, housekeepers, nurses, managers, very eclectic group, to teach our course to all of their coworkers, including new people as they come in. See, when people have a shared set of values, you don't need a lot of rules to tell them how to behave. They, they, they take a sense of ownership for their organization. Now, on that foundation of values, the superstructure is culture. Peter Drucker, the man who invented modern leadership uh, and management, was, the, was famous for saying, culture eats strategy for lunch. And you think about the organizations you admire. And I'll bet you anything, it's not because of their cheap prices, it's because of their reputation for having a great culture. Costco, Southwest Airlines, Zappos, and all the ones on the left side, I'll bet you anything, those are the ones you look up to. Those are the ones that get written about in Fortune magazine about having a great culture or about being a great place to work. Um, Costco and Walmart, they're in the same business, but they have very different cultures. Uh, when Business Week ran a, a cover story on Costco, they wrote about ecstatic employees. <laughs> have you ever heard Walmart accused of having ecstatic employees? Uh, people have to pay to shop at Costco. 
People shop at Walmart because they don't have to dress up like they do for the dollar store. And we encourage the hospitals that we work with, uh, mostly we work with hospitals, uh, to, to create a, a statement of cultural philosophy and expectations. So Children's Hospital New Orleans has one, it's four pages long. And one of the things that they expect, they say, we play so our children can play. This is not an optional thing. We expect if you're gonna work here, that you're gonna understand the healing power of laughter and play and fun, and you're going to engage in those things. My first day working there four years ago, um, I'll never forget because it was a day they sent an 18 month old boy named Jeremiah, who'd been there his entire life, off with his new adoptive parents and they did a second line. They had a jazz band come in and people are dancing and waving their, their handkerchiefs. Mom and dad are over in the corner in tears. They will never forget that day. This is the chief nursing officer at, at Children's with his uh, senior staff reflecting what they say down there in New Orleans. Laissez la bonne temps rouler. Let the good times roll. Have some fun on the job. And the interior finish, back to our construction metaphor, is attitude in the workplace. I took this picture at a school in Vietnam about five years ago. Can you tell who the future leader is in this group? And I'll bet you you single in on the same one I do. And it's the kid who's enthusiastic, who's joyful, who's looking forward to what's about to happen. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement came out with a very important white paper four years ago on joy at work. And look at what they said, joy at work or the lack of joy, it doesn't just impact the employee, it impacts the patient experience, clinical quality, patient safety, organizational performance, it affects everything. And we find that too. I took this picture at the Atlanta airport, Southwest Airlines ad, all airline employees have attitudes, ours just have the good kind. They are using their reputation for positive attitudes to create a competitive advantage against Delta and United and all the others. So these two people have the same job, don't they? And what's different? Attitude. Tell me, who do you think's happier? Dancing with mobs or moping with mob? Who would you rather work with? The dancer or the moper? Who would you rather live with? Most important, who would you rather be like yourself? The most important choice you and your coworkers make every day, and it's more important now than ever, is what's your attitude? Bad things happen, what's your attitude? Somebody says something to you, what's your attitude? You're, you're asked to do a hard task, what's your attitude gonna be? I love this statue by Bobby Carlisle. She's a Colorado artist, and it's called Self-Made Man. And the man has a hammer in one hand and a chisel in the other, and he's carving himself out of a block of stone. That is a beautiful metaphor for what it means to become authentic. And the hammer and the chisel that you use to carve you, for better or worse, is the work you choose to do and the attitude with which you choose to do that work. And I want to share a simple promise that will change your life. And if enough people take it to heart, it'll transform your organization. It's in the Florence prescription book you're all going to get. It's the pickle pledge. I will turn every complaint, my head is killing me, into either a blessing, thank God for modern pharmacology, or a constructive suggestion. First symptom of dehydration is a headache, I should drink some water. And what this does, it, it, it affects you and your attitude at three levels. One, you replace resentment, and complaining is always saying, I'm resentful of something, with gratitude. It replaces learned helplessness, and that's what complaining is. You wouldn't complain if you thought you could do something about it with a commitment to initiative. And the third thing, it replaces poor me, which is what complaining always is, with compassion for others. It turns your gaze outward. And we are seeing amazing things. We're seeing hospitals. This is a hospital in Georgia. This become a pickle-free zone. I don't want to hear your complaining. Take it to HR. They get paid to hear it. People are doing fun things like the pickle parade at Children's Hospital in New Orleans. They're bringing in pickle jars and fine each other every time you're caught moaning, whining, complaining. You're asked to put a quarter in a pickle jar and all the money goes to a good cause. <laughs> One day a guy came in and said, I know it's going to be a day. Here's a buck. I'm paying in advance. These are two of my favorites. Isn't that what complaining people always remind you of? Kind of Oscar the Grouch. And my all-time favorite, be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Nobody ever solved a problem by complaining about it. This is a picture we took last week at Loma Linda University Medical Center in California. 
They are doing the pickle challenge to turn complaints into donations for adolescent behavioral health. Can you think of anything more important today than helping our kids who have had two years of having to stay at home and all the other challenges, seeing the pressures on mom and dad are on? Can you think of anything more important? So anytime somebody finds himself complaining about how hard I have to work, they'll make a donation to something that is a real and serious challenge. We have had so far that we know of, 42 hospitals take this, uh, mostly hospitals challenge, raise almost $100,000 for charities. Um, every now and then I hear from people that we didn't know they were doing it. But remember the paradox that it's hardest to do when you need it the most. Today, the challenges people are facing are very real. They're very legitimate. People are struggling emotionally, financially. They're struggling at home. Those are, we're not telling people don't, don't identify the problems. We're not telling people the problems aren't real. What we're saying is don't complain about them. Work on them. You know, do the serenity prayer. Accept what you can't change, but don't whine about it. But have the courage, have the gumption to work on the things that you complain about that you can do something about. And building a culture of ownership has never been more important. You know, Jim Collins says you got to start by get. He's a, a he writes about leadership and culture. He says you have to start by getting the right people on the bus. I do not agree with that. For one thing, you if you have twenty or two hundred or two thousand people working there, you can't just choose who you have on the bus. Joyce writes a letter to God. Thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> You can't just throw the wrong people off the bus. Peter writes, please send Dennis Clark to a different camp this year. You know what? Until somebody has the courage to confront Dennis Clark about his behavior and how he treats other people, he's going to show up again tomorrow. What you can do is change the bus. What you can do is create a more positive culture, a culture of ownership, a culture that people are proud to be a part of. And I promise you this, you work on creating a more positive culture and you will be astonished at the people you thought shouldn't be on that bus, how they come around, how they turn around. And we need, we need these culture of ownership concepts, not only to apply in the organizations where we work, um, it has become very evident in the last couple of years with COVID and everything else, the silo walls aren't just in organizations, they're between organizations. We need to bring down the silo walls between acute care and long-term care. The COVID problem showed up in long-term care long before they were so evident in acute care. And if we had had, if we had built bridges, done a better job of building bridges, maybe we would have headed off some of the tragedies in long-term care. Hospitals and public health. You know, public health is about preventing. Hospitals are about treating. Um, and again, and we're seeing this. We're seeing hospitals bring down those walls and say, we have to take responsibility for promoting face mask wearing and vaccinations and not just wait until people come in because they're sick and dying of COVID. And as you know, we've got to break down the barriers between urban and rural. It's very, very difficult for many rural organizations to recruit in today's world. Um, urban hospitals, you know, safety net hospitals have their own sets of problems, but they tend to be in, in different worlds and we need to bring down some of those walls. So let me wrap up with a, a few concluding thoughts on leadership. You know, management is a job description. To be a manager means you got to have a title. You have a job description, you get a certain paycheck. Leadership is a life decision. You do not need a management title to be a leader. It, the person who volunteers at a Habitat for Humanity project and says, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do, does not need a title. And in many organizations, the most effective and influential leaders don't have management titles. They lead by virtue of the values that they reflect, by virtue of the character they reflect. Management is what you do. Leadership is who you are. People will look up to you, not just because of what you do, but because of how you do what you do, because of the character you have, the values you live. Management expects compliance. That's what management's about. Do what you're told to do. We're going to hold you accountable for it. Leadership seeks commitment. See, management is transactional. It's about running the business, paying the bills. We've got to get those things done. But leadership is about transformation. 
It's about helping people, changing people, raising people to a higher level of values and personal expectations. Management is accountability. Leadership is ownership. And in today's VUCA world, that's a military acronym that stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. In my lifetime, we haven't seen more VUCA than we have today. We need leadership in every corner of every our organization, not just in the corner office. Joel Barker writes about leadership and he's got a great definition of a leader. He says it's someone who takes you to a place you didn't know you wanted to go. I like that definition a lot because it implies, first of all, creating a vision of that place but second, inspiring people to make the journey, uh, inspiring them to get back up when they fall down, but to never quit. My definition is a little more personal. I define a leader as someone who helps you achieve goals that you didn't know you could achieve by helping you become the person that you did not realize you could be. And that is the secret to creating a culture of ownership where you get a whole new team and don't have to change the people because they change themselves. It's helping your people be that tabby cat that looks in the mirror and sees the lion look back and then does the work to become, to roar, to become that lion. And that is the ultimate, that is the real leadership challenge. So I wanna thank all of you very much for inviting me into your lives today. And I'll close uh, with this. Um, this is how you can reach me. Uh, I'm best reached by email. I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, that's our website and our phone number. Thank you all very much. Um, Godspeed in, in what your work, what you do, because it has never been more important than it is today. Did I pass the audition? I can't hear you guys. Sorry, you did pass the audition, Joe. I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> uh, because, you know, self-inflicted technology problems are, uh, you know, a thing as well. I was muted. Um, thank you for being here, Joe. Thank you for the presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I have a few questions uh, to ask you. Uh, a few have come in, um, and I got a few um, uh, to ask you as well. And you mentioned... Um, you mentioned a lot about the visuality of leadership and things of the, uh, you know, like you, you pointed out the, the, the gentleman or the little kid in India, you know, you automatically zoom in on the happy one. But we're also in a culture right now and in an environment right now where, you know, COVID is starting to go up and it just seems daunting. It seems exhausting, right? How do we, what's the breaking point there? What is something we can do that you feel like can maybe jumpstart this positive motion into, you know, this, this leadership that you speak of? Well, you know, it's the paradox that I mentioned. I have never in my lifetime, um, I haven't seen challenges as daunting as what we're facing today. Um, and so it's more important than ever that we, remain positive, that we remain committed, that we be resilient. It's also harder than ever. As leaders, I think the single most important thing we can do is set a positive example. You know, if you as a leader are whining and complaining about things, uh, you're going to affect everybody else in a negative way. If you as a leader uh, come in and say, man, that was really hard. It's a good thing we're so tough. If you keep a smile on your face, you know, if you walk a little faster, you're going to affect everybody else. Um, so what then about, I think, yeah, let me follow that up real quick. What about the idea of owning your weaknesses and owning the challenges in front of you? Is that not considered a part of leadership? Do you think that's a, a leadership trait? You mean owning your weaknesses as an organization or an individual? Yeah, let's, or say you, yeah, let's say you work for a critical access hospital. You're in the middle of Montana. I guess, uh, wherever you're at. Um, and, you know, you're just, you're struggling with COVID, you're doing these things. And, you know, it's not leading by example, also being able to show your emotions, even if they are negative. Uh, how does that play into it? You have to define what you mean by emotions. You know, if, if, um, if you've lost someone in your community, it's absolutely appropriate to show grief. 
Um, on the other hand, if you as a leader are coming in and showing fear, uh, you're going to you're going to undermine morale in your organization. You're going to undermine optimism. The leader's most important obligation is to inspire hope, no matter what we're going through. So I think, yeah, it is appropriate to show your emotions, but as a leader, you have to be very aware of how you're going to and how those emotions are going to affect other people because it's not just about you. Have you come across, Joe, any situation or an example where somebody has um, maybe not been in a management role, but, you know, you talked about you don't have to be a manager to be a leader, which we all find to be very true, but maybe somebody above you is more of a pessimist or more of a, you know, decimals and dollars type of manager, and you're trying to be cheery and joyful and happy down here. Have you ever come across a situation where that became more of a like outshining the master situation and it, it was detrimental to your employment or your job? How would you handle that? Like you're too happy. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that more than two or three hundred times in the last year or so. Um, <laughs> it, it's a, a constant problem. You know, we did a I did a, a webinar for several thousand nurses and the number one question I got was how do you deal with the emotional vampire when it's your boss and I'd say a couple of things one is you got to put a little wall up that protects you from the negativity of people around you including if that person's your boss two it's occasionally helpful to hold up a mirror you know go to the boss and say you know every time you come in and complain or or bully somebody this is how you affect everybody else I just want you to know that and sometimes the boss, no one's telling the boss. Sometimes they'll say thank you. Um, and the third thing, most important thing is to remember why we do what we do. It's not about the paycheck. It's not about the job title. It's about taking care of people who are sick. And, you know, if we're coming in in a high state of high anxiety, if we're really negative about what's going on, we will affect them. We will affect their healing or their inability to heal. We have an obligation to bring our best selves to work every day, every one of us, um, to care for the people that we serve. And what would you say, Joe, to somebody who is working in a state, almost everybody on this call right now is, uh, you know, working for a state flex program. Um, and what would you say to the person who is maybe trying to make contact with their critical access hospitals, trying to build these relationships and just can't seem to break through on that? How would you tell them to be positive or how can their positivity be manifested into action in that way? Yeah, I wish we had an hour for that question because it's so important. Um, but one of the things that as outsiders with influence that you can do is you can create an expectation that you as a hospital CEO, as a critical access or an FQAC CEO, um, you must work on your culture. We expect that of you. Um, because we know that culture has an impact on clinical quality, patient safety. Um, tell them, hey, uh, I, I saw this guy, Joe Ty, do a, a presentation. I got a book, the Florence Prescription. I, I read it. Have your people read it? Are you working on building that culture of ownership? Have you committed to the eight essential characteristics? Are you creating a culture that's emotionally positive, self-empowered, fully engaged, which is right on the front page of that book? Um, they're going to listen to you. And if they don't, if they don't return your call, show up at the front door, <laughs> you know, keep banging. Right. They, I mean, they need you. They really do. I want to say one more thing about critical access hospitals, because we've worked with a lot of them. And I see, I see almost a bifurcation and a fork in the road here. There are some like the one I mentioned, Tri-County Healthcare. They're, they're uh, dealing with it. They're building a new building. They're, they're positive, they're out there in their community, and there are others that are demoralized and they're saying, oh, we don't have enough resources. And, and some of it is truly financial and physical, but a lot of it is mental and emotional. And it starts with, it starts with the person in the corner office, setting an, an example. Now, Joe, we're talking about, obviously, you've hit on the topic, uh, resiliency and, and hanging in there. And right now, that's more important than ever. And that's our theme. And we've been hitting on it all week. Um, what are maybe some tips? Like at the end of the day, I mean, I have 2,700 yearly annual reports to submit and 14, you know, Excel spreadsheets to submit. And, and, you know, this is just daunting. We're coming in. We got all these different forms to fill out. And at the end of the day, I go home where I walk outside of my office door, how does our personal leadership in our personal lives, how 
what are some tips you can give us for that that can be reflected in our professional lives? How should we be taking care of ourselves? Again, we, we need another couple hours for that, but I do have one very immediate thing, and that is get your body into the act. Imagine this. Imagine you had asked me to be your motivational speaker for this conference, and I come on, hi, I'm Joe. I'm your motivational speaker. I'm going to share with you strategies that will make you rich and famous like I am. And if you, does that work? And, and every conversation you have is not just with the people you're talking to, it's with yourself personally. So when you get up and leave the office, stand up a little straighter, walk a little, put a smile on your face, walk a little faster and talk to yourself. Say, well, it's been a hard day, hasn't it? Well, I guess I'm going to go home and have a beer and talk to my kids. Um, if you do that, it's uh, you cannot be in a separate state physically and emotionally over an extended period of time. Your body talks to your emotions for better or worse. And, you know, slouching home like this, you're going to it's going to drag you down. So a very simple thing you can do is just pay attention to your body language. Do what um, Amy Cuddy is a professor at the Harvard Business School. She calls it power posing. <laughs> do a little bit of that and it's going to help you be more resilient. Yeah, I remember hearing a TED talk one time about making yourself big, right? Like, uh, you know, when you see a bear or a tiger, you're supposed to make yourself big in the face yeah. of that threat. It's kind of the same concept. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, Joe, there's, you know, there's a, a, a cartoon made by Pixar and Disney uh, called The Incredibles. And in the there's a scene uh, where Syndrome, the bad guy, says, if everyone's a super, then nobody's a super. Right. Uh, if everyone's special, then nobody's special. What happens if we're all positive and all happy? Then does it become redundant? Does it become exhausting? What, what do you see? Where do you see this going? What if everyone took your advice right now and changed their habits and behavior? What does that look like? The world would be a much better place because we're all special in our own special ways. We're, aren't, we're not all special the same. When I was at the hospital, I mentioned last week in California, I met a housekeeper named David. He sings for patients. He'll go into a patient's room and he'll sing for them. He's got a really nice voice. This is not in his job description, but this is how he, he does something that's his own form of special. And I guarantee you, two years from now, patients who don't remember the name of the doctor or the nurse, they're going to remember the housekeeper who sang for them. So I don't... You know, I would love to have that problem where everybody's too happy, everybody's too enthusiastic, everybody's too special. That would be a great problem to deal with as opposed to what we're dealing with now. <laughs> I would agree with you. Do you believe that leadership or the lack of leaders? Well, let me change that question. Do you feel like uh, positivity or the lack of positivity is a can also be described as a mental health issue? And if so, do you believe that positivity could be a detriment to health? I absolutely no. I absolutely. I think you're right. It is. It has. It has a very important impact on mental health. You know, there's a whole field of science called neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the human brain to rewire itself physically in response to not only experience but but directed um, mental thought, self-talk. Um, so you know, things like low self-esteem. Um, negative self-talk. Those things are a form, a mild form perhaps, of, of a mental health challenge. Um, I don't see how being too positive uh, can be a mental health challenge unless you cross over to the, to the level of delusional magical thinking, which a lot of people are doing right now with COVID. Oh, we don't have to do anything. It'll just go away. I don't have to get vaccinated. I'll be I'll be OK. I mean, that that's delusional. That is a mental health problem. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. So kind of wrapping it up here, um, what would you say two years from now, two years in the future? What do you feel like our biggest barrier to uh, implementing this uh, culture of positivity is going to be two years from now? Do you think it's going to be the same? Do you think we're going to what's on the horizon? First, let me say, Matt, that you're you're in the wrong field. You should be a reporter because <laughs> you're asking really great questions. Well, I accidentally kept myself muted, so that probably uh, <laughs> keeps me um, from doing a job like that. You know, I'd I'd say two things. One is at a a physical, and one's at a um, emotional level. 
uh, at the physical level, we are heading into what I believe will be the worst staffing shortage um, maybe ever. Um, millions of baby boomers heading for retirement. They're accelerating their plans. People are dropping out of health care because of the challenges of, of the past few years. Uh, hospitals are already spending millions of dollars on travelers because they can't fill their positions. I don't see that getting, I don't see that being any better two years from now. This is why it is going to be so critically important that you are known as a great place to work so that you can recruit more effectively, you can retain the people you have. The second thing that really does concern me is the, the ongoing emotional drain of COVID and everything that goes with it. And the reason that I find it so alarming that we're backsliding now is we've been on this roller coaster. And, you know, a couple months ago, it felt like the light was at the end of the tunnel. And now we're seeing headlines where we're, I'm talking to hospitals that are, or people are overwhelmed. Uh, I was talking to the CNO of a hospital, big city hospital in New York, the chief nursing officer. And she said, when it first broke the first wave she said west point military academy would have been better training for what i'm going through the nursing school was mm -hmm. the second wave hit and she said i don't think my people can do this anymore the third wave hit and she said i know my people can't do this anymore and now if they have a fourth wave i just i just don't know i i think um again this is why public health and this is why the work that you do is so vitally important we we have to prevent we 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 can't continue overwhelming our caregivers because we did not prevent preventable illnesses. Well, Joe, I uh, really appreciate you. I appreciate your feedback. I want to ask one last question. Keep it light. If you could be any animal in the world right now, what animal would you be? Wow. Well, my wife wants to be a mermaid in her next life, so I guess I okay. would be a dolphin. Okay, cool. <laughs> hey, dolphins are super smart. Super smart. They animals. are. And they have fun. Yeah, they do. All right, Joe. Well, thank you so much thank for you guys. everyone listening. Uh, Joe, uh, his ebook is on the download section. It was also included in the chat uh, over there on the right-hand side. So don't take off just yet. We have some important information and some very awesome people that are going to come on and talk to you from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And at this time, it is my pleasure and, frankly, my relief to pass it off to Christy Martinson. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And thanks for your great job this whole meeting, kind of facilitating all of the technology challenges and keeping us entertained. We really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I'm Christy Martinson. I'm the Hospital State Division Director. It's good to see you again today. Um, and I have with me Rachel Moscato and uh, Tori Leach. Um, so Tori, you know, um, well, the FLEX program coordinator. She's been just so great over the past uh, two years, kind of keeping things running on the FLEX team as we had a lot of turnover there um, and just being a great resource internally for the new folks who came on, um, just keeping things running and kind of keeping all of your needs in mind, especially as things were coming with the pandemic and all the changes that impacted your programs, kind of you know, keeping that focus um, on the work that we do. And then Rachel is here now in a new role um, since the last, last FLEX meeting as the, um, the deputy director of the division, taking over from Mike McNeely, who many of you knew well, who is now the division director for the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Rachel from her state office of rural health role, she was the region E and region B project officer and also uh, the program coordinator for our Delta hospital work, um, working with the National Rural Health Resource Center. So we are all excited to talk to you today. I know the title is a little bit of a shift from where we were talking uh, with Joe Tai, but this um, we're going to keep it really high level, not a lot of detail, so don't worry. Um, just kind of to tie in to the theme of what we've been talking about um, and just give you kind of a high level of where we're going um, with our work over the next year. So on the next slide, um, so this topic of building resiliency. Um, you know, this reverse site visit has had a lot of great examples of how we can continue to build resiliency into our programs, celebrating the successes that we have, connecting with others that are having similar challenges and kind of talking through those together and realizing that we're not alone. Um, 
learning from what has worked for others and seeing how we might be able to apply it to our programs and then celebrating all the great work that has happened and all, all the great people that are doing the work. Um, you know, this, what Joe Tai was talking about and those um, pictures that he showed at the beginning of what the nurses, kind of their reactions and what they were dealing with in the hospital, you know, we're kind of one step removed from that, but understanding, you know, that's what all of the people within your um, hospitals that you're trying to work with through the FLEX program are dealing with. And then stepping back and thinking about all the changes that we've had within our own work of how the FLEX program has had to shift. And, you know, our own lives have been impacted as well. So that's just a lot to deal with. Um, and additionally, we've had all the extra money uh, that's come down through the, through the ship COVID work, through the rural health clinic programming that I know a lot of you have um, been instrumental and in kind of help promoting within your states as well. And whatever state level initiatives you have going on as well, it's just been a lot. Um, so this theme of this meeting has been really helpful. The pre-meeting that the task team had put together was really great too, just to kind of talk about those strategies that we can use to kind of help um, deal with these situations where the work just continues. Um, and then the themes that we just heard um, Joe talk about in his presentation were really relevant as well. So we keep that all in mind and knowing the COVID cases are ticking up again. Um, and there is more work to be done with all the money that just came out and the work that comes with implementing those, but realizing even with all of this, what we can do to kind of help make that difference. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've talked about for a while is just this focus on how can we measure the outcomes within our program? So this continues into the next year, of course, um, and thinking about from the federal, state, and hospital level, what we can do to kind of continue the shift for this focus. And knowing, you know, as the FLEX program coordinator, you can set things out from your level, but there's, um, you know, always gonna be challenges of how that gets implemented at the hospital level. And the hospitals in your state are gonna have a variety of needs and they might have issues that come up even when they're participating in some of your programs that might impact their um, ability to participate or get to that outcome. Um, and you've talked, you've heard the FLEX team talk about on Tuesday, um, their work in trying to build that clear framework from the national level of our office. Um, so there's logic models for each of the program areas to really see, you know, how we can help you um, best structure your programs to meet those outcomes. And then being sure to link in and connecting with the work of our technical assistance partners, Arkita and TASC, and the evaluation partners. Um, the Flex Monitoring Team, and how we can all be working together to help you build those strategies at the state level and capture those outcome measures um, for the activities in your state. And we recognize that, again, each of you are in a different place and your hospitals are in a different place. So, you know, it's kind of the journey of moving from activities to outputs and outcomes. And so while we have kind of that main map laid out, that sometimes things are gonna happen and you might have to take a detour with staff turnover or COVID and things end up shifting, but really kind of then reassessing and figuring out, okay, where do we move um, from now? So when we talk about this outcomes, we just wanted to make sure that you kind of understand that's a framework we're coming from. We're looking at it from the national per perspective and understanding that things are gonna look different within each state and within each hospital as well. And all of us, um, from the FORP side and our TA partners and evaluation partners are here to help provide that support as well. So I will turn it over now to Rachel to talk a little bit more about um, what, we're do what we're thinking about in terms of measuring impact. Great, thanks Christy. Um, so when it comes to you know, understanding our impact, within the FLEX program, we have several mechanisms that we have to be able to talk about the impact of our activities. So first, you know, there's those activities that are submitted as part of your work plan. Um, and then, of course, we have the PIMS measures, which both capture some of those outcomes. And then our partners at the FLEX monitoring team really build on that work, helping us highlight the impact of the FLEX program on critical access hospitals nationally. And then also looking broadly at activities that are addressing similar issues to determine what interventions have had an impact. 
And so our goal is really to continue to refine the information that we are collecting from you as flex coordinators so that we can um, best showcase these outcomes and then also have data that is helpful for FMT to use to build on their higher level evaluation work. Next slide. So going back to the theme of resilience and the component of collaboration as a way to maintain resilience, I just wanted to echo the, the words that you've heard from others um, from FORP over these past few days. Um, you know, these quality improvement projects will really be a great way to pilot um, how we can support you as flex program coordinators um, to learn from each other around strategies for managing projects um, and hospital improvement work. And then to see how we can apply this, this type of um, setting more broadly in quality improvement and with other program areas as well. So now um, I'll turn it over to Tori to share some final reflections. Great, thank you so much, Rachel and Christy. We have a fabulous leadership team with the Hospital State Division, and I'm so lucky to work with these two wonderful women as uh, leadership for the division. So I'm just gonna take us through a little bit of reflection. Um, I want you to think back to our three days together. What will you take back to your FLEX program? What do you want to learn more about? These two questions I really hope that you think hard about and you have some tangible takeaways. For me on day one, it was Ben Anderson's keynote speech on health equity and how we need to start with the end in mind. I then attended a breakout session on cultural competencies, which really got me thinking about the ways that we can expand the FLEX program resources in the area of health equity. On day two, my takeaway was our discussion on value-based care and how we need to further engage our leadership for strong value-based care movements. I attended a breakout session on population health hotspotting from New Hampshire, which was a great example of how you can use both flex and ship funding to fund these efforts. On day three, I think Joe Tai really summed it up with a culture of ownership and how we need to own our own culture and how that can be translated to our organization. I also attended a breakout session on the impact of system affiliations, and I think UNC has quite a number of future projects in mind after that discussion. So in closing, I want to remind you to complete the electronic assessment to come in your email. TASC will be distributing information to access the recorded sessions that you may have missed or would like to listen to again. Thank you to all of our speakers, including our State Flex programs. Thank you to our conference planning committee. Thank you to all of the attendees and your hard work and dedication to the FLEX program. There will be a final virtual networking session uh, just following this closing session if you're interested. It's just an open time to chat, so please take advantage if you're interested in connecting with more of your colleagues. A final thank you to the task team for coordinating and hosting these great three afternoons. We would not be able to do this conference without you, so thank you to the entire team. I look forward to seeing you all in person soon, and thank you for a wonderful RSV.